Hello, this is Sue Lloyd, Vice Chair of the ISSB, and I'm joined today by our Chair, Emmanuel Faber, recording this podcast which follows our March uh, board meeting of 2023, which we've held virtually this time. Um, much less fun. I think uh, Emmanuel and I would both agree, um, but it really reflects the fact that we've got quite a short uh, board agenda today, which uh, this week, which I'll talk about in a moment, which reflects the fact that we are busy as a board documenting and balloting and finalising S1 and S2. So we've got other things other than decision making to focus on at the moment. So a short board week. Um, so we covered uh, at this month's meeting the upcoming agenda consultation and we had an educational session which was about the next phase of our work um, um, improving the SASB standards. I'll get to those in a moment but before we get into that Emmanuel perhaps you'd like to update our listeners on some of the things that we've been doing since our last podcast which we recorded back in Montreal just before we had our um, sustainability symposium in February. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sue. Um, and I would echo your comments about our um, discussion today. We saved on the carbon, uh, but we unfortunately also cut on the coffee breaks and the discussions and the hugs and all the emotion of staying all together, standard setting. Uh, but I think all good in terms of content. And before we come to that, let me say indeed that quite a lot has actually happened. Uh, since we last recorded uh, our podcast in Montreal. Um, there was certainly first and foremost a very uh, lively symposium the day after uh, the end of our board week in Montreal with over more than 1,000 participants from 45 countries. We then uh, um, had a very supportive uh, declaration from IOSCO entering the final edition phase of our standards. Uh, that enabled uh, them to move forward with their independent assessment, uh, which they aim to complete uh, in 2023. It's very important because as a, the association of organizations that regulate the world securities, um, we'll decide whether to endorse that encouraging adoption in jurisdictions around the world, of course. We, we then had also support expressed again by the finance ministers of G20 and the central bank governance uh, through a statement in uh, February 24, saying that they were looking forward to the early finalization of our standards. Um, another eventful week was Japan, uh, which we visited with the trustees. Uh, we had a meeting with the prime minister, Fumio Kishida, who welcomed progress and also uh, addressed um, uh, an audience uh, in a, an event that we co-hosted with the Japanese Financial Services Agency. Uh, we had Lara Fink at this event also providing a keynote. Um, we signed an MOU with Japan Financial Accounting Standards Foundation to extend the commitment to our Asia Oceania office, which will also support the work of ISSB. And finally, I'd say, and probably very excited about this, we had a meeting with the Sustainability Standard Board of Japan, who is committed to build uh, on global on our global baseline and to work closely with ISSB with already some uh, very clear deadlines as to when they want to be able uh, to provide um, their own st set of, of, of standards. So, I mean, exciting months, and we've seen a number of jurisdictions now starting preparations globally for the issuance of S1 and S2 literally across the globe and that, and that was a you know that that really paved the way for the next stage as we will probably discuss at the end of this podcast of what we're doing with s1 and s2 um, <clears throat> but now maybe back to this week uh, sue a march meeting perhaps you could explain a bit more about the educational session that we had in the first part of our board session um in on international applicability of the SASB standards, please. Sure. So this was quite um, exciting because it's the first time that the board has talked about its other standards. We talk about the ISSB standards a lot. This is the first time we did a real deep dive as a board into the SASB standards as a sort of standalone set of literature. And that's uh, an important part of our job because one of the things that we took on as our responsibility um, with the consolidation with the Value Reporting Foundation was the fact that we are now responsible for maintaining, enhancing and looking after the suite of SASB standards as well as developing our own ISSB standards. And so this was really the first um, 
discussion related to that. And what we were talking about uh, today was um, to do with the role of our SASB standards in S1. So those of you who watch our work will know that in S1, we ask companies to provide information on all of their important sustainability related risks and opportunities. And in the absence of a specific standard like our climate standard S2, we ask companies to refer to and consider the SASB standards. And so the first thing that we're doing with the SASB standards is making sure that when companies benefit from referring to them and use them, that indeed they are fully internationally applicable. And so we're doing a targeted project that we are aiming to complete in time for the effective uh, dates of application of S1 um, to really make sure that in cases where the SASB standards refer to specific US regulation or um, uh, legislation, that a company knows what to do if that's not applicable to them. And we know that people already um, cope with that today. We already have actually more than two and a half thousand companies in over 70 jurisdictions using the SASB standards. So we know that these are useful standards globally, but we do want to make sure that when you get referred to a, uh, a metric in the SASB standards, if it does refer to a specific jurisdictional law or regulation that doesn't really directly apply to you, that it's clear what to do. And so this is a targeted project to propose updates uh, to the standards to address um, that issue. So what we're doing is we are developing an exposure draft that will set out the methodology that will describe how we plan to update those sorts of references in the SASB um, standards. We're going to consult on the methodology rather than putting out a document that shows every, you know, strike through and markup of every individual change to those uh, jurisdictional references in the SASB standards. We're doing it that way so that we can really get feedback on the process that we're using. Um, in addition, we will do outreach that enables us to get specific feedback from our stakeholders on the specific changes. Um, our SASB Standards Board Advisor Group, which brings recommended changes to the full board, um, is working on the draft exposure draft. We expect that draft document to come back to the board, maybe in the April board meeting, and hope to publish an exposure draft ratified by the full IASSB soon thereafter, um, and with a view, as I said, to completing um, the changes to the SASB standards to help those using S1 um, around the end of this year. So that was an educational session, really to get us all used to how we're going to be working with the SASB Standards Board Advisor Group that brings recommendations to the board and to get the board up to speed on this very focused project to update jurisdictional references in the SASB standards. So Emmanuel, maybe you'd like to talk about the other um, uh, topic that we discussed in the board meeting, which was a decision-making meeting, and it was relating to our agenda consultation um, project. Sure, thank you, Sue. And so after our non-coffee break, uh, we engage today in the second part of our conversations uh, at the board, and that was about uh, our agenda consultation. So, as I think everyone in the audience would uh, remember, um, we started with a mandate that said climate first, but not climate only. So, we've been working for several months now and committed that we would launch um, a request for information on what comes next after climate. Um, in the course of this year. Uh, so in December, um, we uh, announced that we would consult on four projects for prioritization, biodiversity, ecosystem and ecosystem services altogether, human capital, uh, human rights and connected reporting. So today's discussion was uh, to progress the finalization by staff of uh, a paper that uh, we will look at in one of our next boards to finalize the RFI uh, document itself. And it focused on the fourth of the projects, Connected Reporting, um, to decide to advance our description of what that project entails. And the reason that um, the staff felt that was a need um, to, to refine our approach here is that we have actually, uh, when finalizing S1 and S2 um, in December, January, and February, um, we've brought a number of additional 
uh, topics that were worth considering before um, or in the finalization of the RFI. One of them was that um, in, ad in addition to the content of the ED that was nearly a year ago, uh, in December we decided to um, insert some very fundamental uh, aspects of the integrated reporting thinking in the, the, the core of S1 by recognizing that uh, the value that a company uh, business is creating is inextricably linked to its uh, stakeholders, the civil society in which it operates, natural resources it depends on. And by doing that, we've already embedded at the very core um, of, our, of our standard S1 the, the, some of the very foundational aspects of integrated reporting. The second is that when we finalized um, uh, S1 and S2 in February, we embarked, um, in particular through the January uh, meeting, um, a number of decisions that borrowed from our sister board's work uh, on the IFRS accounting side, in particular when it comes to some scalability and proportionality, um, and there's a number of examples of that in a paper that was prepared for the February board, and that's very explicit. So there was this notion that uh, connectivity is something that we have already addressed in a significant manner as a very young board in the six months of our work, uh, 20 deliberations, where we borrowed from you know, IAS1 to confirm the materiality assessment that we would use uh, with our focus on our primary users being uh, the users of general purpose uh, financial report um, to IFRS uh, 8 and IFRS 9 and many others. And so, um, you know, even with some staff from the technical staff of IFRS uh, accounting and IASB um, working um, to prepare papers for our own review when it came, for instance, to the connected, uh, sorry, to the um, 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 current and anticipated uh, um, consequences and effects of sustainability uh, risks and opportunities on financial statements. Uh, so what I'm saying here is that I think we realized that uh, we were embedding the notion of connecting with the financial statements in an our everyday standard setting without having a separate uh, project to say, how do we think about connectivity? So these two aspects, the notion that integrated reporting was now landed into our S1 and second, a lot had already been done in terms of connections with the work of the accounting side of the IFRS Foundation led the staff to reposition with a broader question uh, what the fourth project could be, essentially asking how urgent and important it is that we uh, are progressing the integrated reporting framework, thinking um, in our agenda for the next two years, and how much of that uh, should uh, embark work about the management commentary um, you know, it being very clear for us that if the IASB is um, now going to work on their management commentary and climate uh, aspects that are on hold, uh, we would be obviously working in support of their work with or without a joint project around integrated reporting. So that's, I think, what we have been discussing. Uh, it was interesting to listen to various comments and through various angles. Not everyone agreed that uh, things needed to be reshaped that way. But at the end of the day, I think there was a, a pretty wide consensus uh, in the decision that we've made that this is the right approach. But and again, I think uh, all aspects of the conversation and all angles that were brought by our colleagues around the table to this will enrich the finalization by our staff um, of the RFI paper, which I'm really excited to be looking at uh, in hopefully not a too long number of weeks, um, or high number of weeks, as a, as a board in one of our next uh, sessions. So, Sue, I think that, uh, that concluded uh, our uh, 
our meeting for today. And um, before closing this podcast, could you offer us a little bit of flavor about what's going to happen and what's on the agenda of, uh, of our work before we meet in April in Frankfurt? Sure. So firstly, lots of reading. That's not very exciting for people to listen to, but it's a reality. Busy reading drafts of uh, S1 and S2 and getting them ready for prime time. So that will be taking up a lot of our time, but nobody else other than us needs to worry about that for the moment. Um, the other thing that we're doing is really looking forward to sort of the next phase of our life, if you like. So capacity building and thinking about adoption um, of our standards and use around the world. But let's talk about capacity building for a moment. So People who have been following our work will know that we have talked quite a lot about the fact that we don't think that our job finishes when we finalise our standards. We know that sustainability reporting is very much um, new. It's still in its infancy, and that's you know particularly the case for emerging markets and smaller companies, but it's also the case that even in uh, developed economies and for larger companies, you know, there's lots of people still learning uh, what uh, sustainability reporting is all about and, you know, needing to collect data and have new systems put in place to get it all going. So we see us ourselves having a really important role to play both directly and with our partners to really get into the space. So what we're doing on there is making sure that basically we help upskill everybody, you know, that there's a level playing field that everybody understands what's needed and, and can get on board and start their sustainability um, reporting journey. Um, we will particularly focus on meeting the needs of developing and emerging economies of global south, which is why um, we're fortunate that I have a counterpart as Vice Chair Jing Dong Hua, who's joined us to really focus on this capacity building with Global South in particular. Um, but it's a big job to do. You know, we know that companies need support, the audit firms need support, regulators need support, and even investors using the information need to get used to the type of information that will be available and uh, sort of learn how to use it. And so we're a small organisation and we can only do so much of that ourselves. So we are really delighted to have put in place a partnership framework with many um, from the public and the private sector who we'll be working with to undertake this big capacity building um, project around the world. So to give you some tangible examples of the sorts of things that we're working on, we are working with the International Securities Regulators, IOSCO, and their uh, training program. We're working with the UN Sustainability Stock Exchange to update, update guidance for their members and deliver training for um, issuers. We're working with IFAC, um, the accounting side, to deliver training to supplement existing accounting qualifications. And we are also working alongside the Global Reporting Initiative um, and with CDP, especially focusing on how we can get this to work uh, with companies current our reporting practices. So a really big initiative and push from our side to really complement uh, the publication of S1 and S2. And Emmanuel, maybe from your side? Yeah, well, thank you, Sue. And most of that I have to say we're doing, um, you know, as partners, uh, Jin Dong, yourself, myself, and I'm really excited to see also um, our colleagues, members of uh, the board being able more and more to engage um, in, in these important exercises as we are ramping up in our capacity um, to, to prepare regulators, um, preparers, investors to use, um, to use our standards. Um, so on my side, maybe just a couple of things to add here. Uh, first of all, just say that um, we'd be delighted to have our Sustainability Consultative Committee as well as the Advisory Council of the IFRS Foundation uh, meeting in April in a timely manner. Uh, to also, um, you know, get their precious inputs and guidelines as we finalize our uh, paper for the RFI on the agenda consultation, of course, and closer to the start setting work immediately in S1 and S2, uh, just to share that Jin Dong and myself will be attending the World Bank Spring meetings in Washington, D.C. Uh, in April, and there is a whole slate of meetings, Minister of Finance, um, bank governance supervisors and a number of other constituencies and, and stakeholders that we will be uh, meeting and meeting again there um, to uh, um, start and continue the conversation and uh, the important momentum which uh, is there behind establishing a common language for sustainability related 
financial disclosures uh, worldwide. And so I guess with that and probably more that we can speak next time uh, about, um, I look forward to updating all of our uh, audience here of this podcast with you, Siu, and or Jin Dong on all of this and the outcomes also of our Frankfurt meeting in April uh, during our next podcast. So thank you everyone for uh, attending this uh, this podcast session with you and myself and uh, We'll speak to you in a month's time. For the latest developments from either the International Sustainability Standards Board or the International Accounting Standards Board, make sure to subscribe on the IFRS Foundation website, www.ifrs.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take some time to rate, review and subscribe on your preferred podcast player.